Now then, what is happening guys? Welcome to this episode of the Mentality Podcast. Just before we launch into the episode and the free-for-all, which is between me, Craig White and Paul Wood, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about me going over and um, what it's all about. So I drove to Macclesfield yesterday to Craig White's house, had a sit down with him and Paul Wood and um, it was a very, very interesting conversation and um, I may have got a free coaching coaching lesson out of it. <laughs> um, as Craig White is a men's coach now, um, he has worked in various, various different clubs in rugby, both codes, um, as a conditioner and um, a top quality conditioner. Um, he's won Grand Slams, he's won all sorts of championships, he's worked for World Rugby and he's been across the world providing different services in that role. It came to a point um, six years ago where Craig decided he had to leave um, that job um, as after coming back from a yoga retreat um, six years ago, or eight years ago in fact, he actually realised that he was looking at the old stuff he was doing, um, his job, how he was living his life through a different lens. And it seemed to Craig that he had to move on and do something different, um, which is an extremely interesting thing to chat about. And, and I was all the more um, happy to hear about how, how he was coaching men now and how he'd moved on to a different job. And also in the podcast is Paul Wood. I interviewed Paul Wood eight months ago for mentalitymagazine.com. And he spoke very openly about his past with depression, um, his OCD and and stuff. How, how he, he mentioned a, a quote, I can remember that his, his head was like a washing machine, just going round and round all day. And he couldn't um, separate from his thoughts and he'd react very... I guess he'd, he'd be re very reactive to his emotions and feelings and thoughts and that's how he'd lived, lived through his, his life. Um, so you may hear in this podcast how both these guys have took on a bit of a transformation and, and how they live their lives in, in how they navigate through life and it's quite a refreshing um, listen really and, and I really enjoyed the chat and um, I put my points of view in here and there and and I'm just enjoying the chat, as always. Um, this is a good time, I reckon, to let you know who the podcast is brought to you by. This episode of the podcast today is brought to you by MSC Nutrition. Um, the base in Cardiff, MSC Nutrition is quickly becoming the go-to brand for professional athletes and teams. Having raised its profile in through similar sponsorship signings with Carl Frampton, Sam Quek, Sam Davies and more, they're jumping on with mentality and um, really supporting what our cause is, what our message is and what we're wanting to do in the media game, I reckon. And UK Red Security are also bringing you this podcast today. The owner of, of the of the company, Kevin Walton, is a great guy and they're a very humble and honest brand and they trade three, six, five days of the year, 24-7. Um, they offer a whole host of services for a security and fire system that you may need domestically or business-wise. Um, so I would say they're the first point of call to go to. Um, they certainly will be when my new house is ready, which is fantastic. I think the intro is done there. I think we can put you straight through to my chat yesterday as it was the 19th of april not the 19th of april what month are we in what month are we in 19th of may jesus right yes this is the mentality podcast i hope you enjoy it i wanted to just be quite a good conversation and just chat about where you've been craig where you've been paul what you've learned and um i guess what your views are to what's going on now with Obviously, we have probably find ourselves in a bit of an epi epi epidemic, I should say, um, with, with all the suicides and mental health problems, and, and you see it more and more now. I guess it's being reported more and more, but there's obviously people starting to confront themselves with a problem. Um, but I imagine it'd be a, a good start, Craig, just for you to, to tell your story, where you've been, um, what, you, what you've done as an occupation, and, and where you find yourself now. Yeah, cool. So I'm um, originally a, a rugby league lad, like you two. Um, I was raised in Wigan, and rugby league was really my life for um, a long, 
a long time from the age of eight and um, I always thought I was going to play for Wigan. Played at a high level, uh, represented Bala, but then kind of went a bit crazy in my teens and it didn't kind of work out the way it was supposed to or the way I thought it was supposed to. And it took me a while to grow up, but eventually I went back to university to study sports science and cut a long story short, I also was working during university with um, Phil and Andy Clark's company at the time, which was more towards sports conditioning. And I had a lot of experience with them, um, with some league teams, but also uh, union teams. And then when I finished university, I kind of started my career properly and cut a long story short, again, I've been working for about 22, 23 years in professional rugby, um, initially as a strength and conditioning coach and then kind of evolving into this, if you like, more holistic role as, as a high performance coach. My first, my sorry, last full-time job was with, with a Welsh rugby team. I gave that up actually six years ago. What happened to me six years ago, or maybe what I should say is before that, so before six years ago in my rugby conditioning career, we probably getting to around the 15 year mark, um, I went to do some yoga in Thailand, just didn't think nothing of it, just was on a bit of a holiday. And it changed my whole look on life and my values and what I thought was important in life had shifted 360 degrees. So I went back home and I went back into the job with the Welsh rugby team and um, I, I just didn't recognize myself anymore and I didn't recognize the world around me. Uh, maybe it was a midlife crisis, or so, people, so many people call it a crisis, but um, it was definitely difficult to relate to the world and it was definitely hard to relate to the job you know, this whole concept of winning. And I think what had happened looking back is I'd spent 15 years wanting to be the best conditioning coach in the world and I, I got to a fairly high level. I went on to Lions Tours and worked for Wales and worked for Ireland and Wasps and Leicester and World Rugby and a few other teams. But I did that with a real relentless drive and not without much space in my life. I just worked. I was the first in the gym at six o'clock in the morning with my staff, teaching them things. And then I'd be the last one at home and I was just striving to be the best, Co course after course. Um, and always always the, the one driving things within the teams that I work for. But when I kind of had that experience in Thailand, all of a sudden I had a month where there was some space in my life, which hadn't been there before. And when this space was there, things started to come up thoughts started to come up and I felt a shift, but there was also a sense of uncomfortableness. I didn't really like what was coming up, especially when I went back to Wales and, and it was a struggle. I didn't know what was wrong, but I couldn't enjoy the job anymore that I'd previously loved. Um, I felt like an alien. I'd go home from work in the evening time and I cried to my wife and I didn't know why. I just didn't know why I couldn't put my finger on it. Uh, but I knew one thing that I needed to get out of that job. Somehow things had shifted so much that I, I couldn't be in that job anymore. And looking back, I couldn't relate to this concept of winning at all costs anymore. It had driven me for so many years, but then I couldn't relate to it anymore. It was like, wow, well, what's the point? Um, what's it all about? And I then... I then I, Looking back, that's probably the time when I started to ask those life questions, which come to every man, actually. You know, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? And uh, and where am I going? So then I left that job and I actually moved to Thailand because I loved the yoga and, and meditation so much. And um, I kind of got more into that. And then over the last six years, especially, what I've done is I've developed a, a different skill set if you like, related to performance. Um, I developed a skill set around um, understanding the mind, understanding human behavior. I studied NLP, emotional wellness. 
I became a yoga and meditation teacher. I studied life coaching. And um, I kind of developed a skill set along those lines, which complemented some of the other skill sets I had around, around sports performance. And um, a couple of years ago, I, I was still working in rugby as a consultant um, with World Rugby, which I only recently gave up. But over the last two years, I've been developing um, a men's coaching business to, to really try and help men from all walks of life to make sense of this struggle that happens in every man's life. Where, I don't know when he's around 30 or 35, and, but in many cases now, much earlier, there's a, there's a period in, in a man's life when he does start to ask the questions, you know, what, what is it all about? Um, what am I supposed to be doing here? And um, what choices do I have in life? Um, and I'll leave it there for now and I'll, I'll come back to that. But basically I was working in, in sport and I've got a, a lot to thank sport for, especially rugby. Um, and I still have some connection with rugby, with, with some of the clients that I'm working with. Um, but I'm really driven to, to just help men of, of all walks of life to make sense of this, if you like, midlife crisis and reframe it so they realize it's a midlife crisis transformation and a potential for growth and um and help them move forward in life yeah that's a well, brilliant answer and um it, there's quite a lot in there i just want to i want to i want to tap out of that but um i guess a quote that keeps coming up to me and what i can relate to a bit when i was a bit younger i remember chatting to to woody over on in uh, bert services when we did that interview um i think i was looking back then i was in between that balance of that appreciation for what you've already done what you've already got and just the constant need to achieve. And I know you mentioned that there. Um, it was like a, when he was working, it's almost like a relentless drive to to win, you know, win at all costs and to try and make more headway in, in your job. And I guess maybe you got to the top um, and all the, you know, if you, if you imagine it on the pressure cooker, you keep going up and up and then you kind of realised that you got to that, that position and that point and you thought, oh, well, what is it now? What, you know, what am I meant to be doing now? Um, and I don't know. I don't know what you think. You guys think to that, but um, maybe that's a, a, a quite a big. Like I'm seeing in the news a lot recently. There's all the more being reported with with athletes saying they're going to rehab and uh, Greg Inglis just recently. Um, I don't know if that's a big thing. You know, I don't know if that's a big thing where they've been sold like what what they need to do. You know, all through their career, all through their their life as a youngster, um, they get it. They start doing it, and then. To realize, oh well, what else is it? What else am I meant to do? It's quite a deep level. It's quite more of a holistic level to look at. But um, I guess it may be that balance of appreciation and achievement. I'm not sure. Can I answer that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, this search for recognition is really, really interesting, and it's not an easy one to grasp. But somehow, um, there's a magic in it. It's almost as if life presents a situation to us when we're children that we don't get the recognition from, I don't know, mum, dad, sister, brother, whatever it is, our friends, school, society as a whole, and we don't get the love that, you know, we, we, we are owed or we're, we're, we're duty bound to receive. And somehow it's life kind of presenting that situation to us for a reason. And then we spend most of our childhood and early adult life searching for recognition um you know we believe we didn't receive it as, enough as a kid and we really really search for it and that could be academic qualifications it could be applying yourself in your job it could even be that you go on a worldwide trip but ultimately we're, we're searching for recognition recognition from others but also recognition on the inside and it's a natural process it really really is um and that can continue into, into life as well. Some people um, create more companies, they become a millionaire. In my case, I really wanted to get as many qualifications as, as much as I could, BSc, MSc, PhD and all that. Um, and you're right, the, it, there comes a point where you realize actually, I, once you have the recognition, you're still not happy, you're still not centered, you're still not complete 
there's still something missing. And then is the questions come, well, who am I and what am I supposed to be doing here? But that is really a positive and it's a process that every man has to go for, go through. There's nothing wrong with the search for recognition because at the highest level, it's a search for love, which we all need as human beings. It's human need, the need for recognition and the need to feel connected to something in the world. So it's, 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 a, it's a real natural process that we have to go through and we have to realize that once we get it, it's still not it. And then the questions start to uh, be asked. But then it's also a time beyond that uh, recognition. It's also a time where we become less selfish. We've, we've received selfish recognition for ourselves. And then we start to go into how can I make positive changes in the world? What can I do to help others? Um, and, and we develop a little bit more compassion and we slowly become more selfless. So it's, it's a, a, proce a natural process. And it's really important to understand that natural process because some guys, they get to a critical point in their life and they don't understand the process and they continue to look for the recognition. Yeah, uh, I don't know if, if you've got anything on that, Paul, but do um, you think it's a cycle that needs to happen then? Do you think people... So you've mentioned the kind of... the bridge where people get to the end and then they say, right, well, I need to make some decisions here, ask some questions, but then they start looking for the same sort of stuff and they get themselves, you know, in the capitalist culture and and um, looking for rewards, you know, external rewards and stuff. Do you think that's where people may, um, you know, may start to feel, you know, depressed or down or whatever? Do you think that's a, a, a main reason? Because um, I guess it's put in our face all the time, isn't it? Um, you know, through adverts, you know, you know, kind of selling that, you know, that lifestyle for what it's meant to be and, and what everyone's gleaming about on social media and everything. Um, I guess it's an interesting topic to to say there's kind of a point where someone has to look at, I guess that's a service, what you know, what you're offering, Craig, in a way that, that kind of, that, get, I guess that situation which the man arrives at, um, where they need to look in a different direction or look at something else. Yeah, just, just, on, just on that, I mean... For me, just going back there, what you know, just going back on the Greg Inglis thing, you know, class as the world's best rugby league player. Um, we, for me, we don't need any more evidence that success, you know, it it it's short term happiness. Um, we only need pick a daily newspaper up and read about celebrities and millionaires and you know footballers, whoever it is, you know, and they seem to they've got this uh, ideal lifestyle, cars, money you know, wife, everything else. But they're not happy, are they? You, do you know what I mean? And and, and I was I was like that with my rugby and and Craig touched on it there. He said about, you know, we're looking for that recognition. You know, it was all about um you know, my, my social instinct was just constantly kicking in with me and I needed to be accepted. So that drove me to want to be the best rugby player I can be. So when I left school, you know, and, and again, Craig touched on it there about, you know, feeling that he didn't have enough, you know, compassion and stuff when I was when I was younger. I was always searching to be accepted by people. And um, that's what drove my rugby league career. And and a lot of the decisions that I made was was based on that, just being accepted as, as a person. And it only drives you for so long. And, and, and myself, I got to that stage where... I was just thinking, what's life all about? What am I doing? You know, I'm coming to the back end of my career. You know, yeah, I, I played in some big games and I'd won some big games, but ultimately it was all short term. They would only last a day, two days, you know, that joy. And then you're back to the, you know, looking within. And, and that's where it comes for me now. It's all about looking um, at at myself where you know i need to be happy inside i can't rely on other people's uh, behavior to make me happy do you know what i mean it all comes to me if someone doesn't want to speak to me but someday i can't let that upset me because that's dictating how i live my life you know that's looking for that recognition so i've sort of gone away from that um now and it's it's like a big relief for me not you know not want i want to be accepted but i'm not doing things to be accepted do you know what i mean if that makes sense yeah, yeah. it's like you, you're almost not hungry for that acceptance to feel better do you know like um it's quite it's quite a good thing you're saying i remember when when we, we chatted a while back and um 
I guess it only works for so long. That's, you know, the kind of rely on an external outcomes and, you know, external rewards and benefits to make me happy. Um, I remember when we chatted a long time ago, uh, but it's just coming up to a year now, um, when you mentioned about, I think you'd you'd win won in the semi-final against Saints and and I think you'd, you were coming through to the final players actually against against Leeds 2012, but you just didn't, you didn't feel like the rest of the boys, you didn't feel like the rest of the team and I don't know whether that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of the thing where it's running out and you're saying, all right, well, it's time to ask the questions, what's going on here? Do you know what I mean? Like actually confronting it. Because I think that's a that's a period where people need to kind of, I guess, look, you know, and ask those questions, pose them and kind of responses to what you need. I don't know. Yeah, I was. I mean, you know, that talking about that game, it was we played Huddersfield in the semi-final and, you know, that was... Um, that was a game we won, which a week later, uh, sorry, two weeks later, we'd be playing at Wembley Stadium in front of eighty thousand people, and I wasn't feeling it. You know what I mean? I wasn't. It didn't excite me. It didn't happen. It didn't make me happy. And I remember walking around, clapping the fans, and thinking, "I don't want to be here." Do you know what I mean? So, I, I can't, I can't pinpoint why I felt like that, but I just know that um, the external. A rugby game. I was relying too much on a rugby game to make me happy. I was relying too much on a on a, a last Friday of each month to make me happy when I was getting paid. I was relying on going buying a new car, buying a new property, all those things. I was relying on to make me happy, and it just wasn't. It just wasn't happening. And um, you know that breaking point came for me where I just asked that question: What's it about? Because to me, uh, you know, I. I I had a decent life uh, financially. I was okay, but just not happy. So, um, yeah, you've, I think you've got to ask some questions um, about, you know, what, what do you value? And um, it, to be honest, the way that I was thinking, it was draining. It was just mentally draining. And I just got to a point where I thought, you know what, I can't fight the world anymore because that's what I felt like I was doing. I was trying to change things that I couldn't possibly change. Do you know what I mean? So you're in a constant struggle with life and you've just got to accept sometimes that things are what they are. Um, and when you're least, when you're, resi when you're not as resistant, when you don't resist against life, things flow. When you fight against life, it's just, it's just, you know, it's like swimming against a tide. You know what I mean? Instead, instead of swimming against a tide, turn around and just let it take you into the beach. Life's yeah. easier. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I, can't, I can't explain it any different yeah. from that. But that for me is what, that would be the ideal way to describe how my life was. I was swimming against the tide and I just turned around and I went, you know what? I'm going back to the beach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's class. It is. <laughs> that's class. Because <laughs> I, I remember you um, you showed me that book actually and, and I texted you a, a few months after and saying, um, it's by Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now. And I'd read, that's the first kind of book I'd read like that. And it opens a completely new world to you, like a, way, a new way to look at life and, and just exactly what Paul mentioned there. Um, just to just to think about things different and, and and more or less actually in the book he says not to think you know he just says just be present and just do just do as you please and i i listen to um i reckon i've listened to a lot of i uh, don't know if you guys have heard him but alan watts um he's you know he, he's someone that's really changed my perspective and i guess helped me look at the world in a different way and, and in a way which you can't really um, map out you know I, I get we're raised to be mapping out what you want to do you know so in my experience it was um, say from 16 years old it was to get my A-levels balance that alongside rugby and, and then be the best rugby player and then go from there and then go from there and go from there and what I realised is it doesn't happen like that it does not happen like that I've picked up some big injuries I've picked up a lot of setbacks along the way and and some you know some some hard times at that um and there's a there's there's actually a there's actually like a fable that, that Alan Watts says and it's about a Chinese farmer and um the Chinese farmer's working one day with his horses on the farm um and and the horse one of his horses runs away and all the neighbors come round um they come come round from their houses and they're all in uproar and they go, oh, that's, that's terrible news, isn't it? That's that's just terrible. What are you going to do? That's, you know, that's um, really bad news for you. And he says, well, maybe. Anyway, the next day he's, he's knocking about the farm and then the, the horse returns with um, with seven other wild horses. 
And then all the neighbours come around and go, that's brilliant, isn't it? Isn't that fantastic? And um, he just replies, maybe. The next day he's out, out working on the farm with his son, taming the horses. His son falls off and breaks his leg. And all the neighbours are around again. And they, they, they're, they're just saying, oh my God, you know, dreadful news. How bad is it? And he says, maybe. And then the next day, um, turns out the China go to war and um, the conscription um, come round and they're looking for people to go to war. And they come in the house and they see the son on the bed and they go, oh, looks like he can't go to war. He's broke his legs, no use to us. And all the neighbours come round then and they go, well, this is absolutely fantastic. You must be made up. And the Chinese farmer just replies, maybe. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, it's like, so I look at my experiences and I think, well, how can you, I think, I think some people have to say, how can you think you're always so right to know what's going to happen and mm. judge, judge circumstances and what's going to happen? You know, you need to, with the nature of what happens day in, day out, if you're going to pin your hopes or pin all your happiness and expectation of one thing that happens, you know, you're, uh, you're mad or you're just completely delusional because, you know, I, I, I did my knee and I'm out for 12 months, but it led me to, I guess, create mentality and look at di things in a di different way because I was banging at the door constantly, kept getting these injuries and I'm going, well, I can't just bang at the door when I'm unable to do something. I need to do something else. Then it led me to chat to Woody and he showed me that book and then here we are talking about this kind of stuff. So I think it's, you know, when you look back, it's quite... It's quite um, humbling to to chat to you guys and 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 see what you think and and get more inspiration. I guess. What were the next steps for you guys? Like, so you've you found yourself in a position where you're right, go look at need to look at other stuff. What were the next steps you took? Well, for me, um, and this applies to rugby players in general at the moment. Um, and the reason I'm saying rugby players is because you're both rugby players or ex-rugby players and we're both kind of involved in rugby. We're hearing a lot in rugby at the moment about mental health and guys stepping up and um, proclaiming they have mental problems. So so the story that I want to show now relates to that as well. And the first real benefit is to educate yourself around what has happened in your life to date and also educate yourself in relation to your emotional landscape, what's going on at a level of the emotions, the emotions and coming to some level of, of understanding because when this question comes, who am I, what the fuck am I supposed to be doing, what's life about, have I wasted my life, fear comes. It's the natural emotion that really kicks in and fear unfortunately can drive a guy to suicide if there's a lack of understanding and a lack of support but on the flip side, fear is the doorway to transformation. But the transformation can only come when there's, number one, an understanding that life has happened to you for a reason and there's gold in that. So for me, it, it, it actually did involve looking at my upbringing and um, looking at the way my dad conditioned me, looking at the way my dad was a role model to me, realizing that... Um, it wasn't my fault that I behave and react in certain ways, but it also wasn't my father's fault that he behaved in a certain way and conditioned me. And then you go back, it wasn't his father's fault and so on and so on. So you realize that it's actually nobody's fault. So there's no blame here going on anybody. I don't blame myself. I don't blame my old man for maybe not being the, the role model that I, I would have wanted him to be. I also bring some gratitude to my father in the sense that um, he did provide me with a lot of love based on his model of the world and how he knew how to give love. But also I thank him because I chose to be not like him. My father was a normal bloke that went to work every day from seven in the morning till four at night, went home, was tired, sat on the couch, watched TV. And I chose not to be like that. So I, I, so actually I, I, I can thank him for that. It was really... Um, a, a revelation when I came to that and I can also I can look at my mother and our mothers are really the, the, the person in our life that create the way we deal with emotions when we're pregnant with her but also in the first few years of life um, uh, the mother is um, teaching us how to be emotional so again I can examine my mother's life and look at the problems she had 
and some of the trauma that she had in her life and again come to an understanding that number one, actually the way I dealt with my emotions was just basically the way I was taught by my mother. So I can disidentify from that. I can empower myself to say, do you know what? I've learned this from my mother. She's taught me how to behave in this certain way. She's taught me to be this certain emotional man. Um, but I don't have to identify with that anymore. Thank you, mom. I know you had some problems and your mom had problems, etc., etc. But now I'm coming in, into a place where actually I have a choice here. I've identified with mother and father for so long. You know, they've given me all these behavioral traits. But now I can move on into a... Uh, 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 almost a new me and and I wouldn't say I was reborn but you know you do hear that term sometimes and that's exactly what that means it just means that somebody's come to a point in their life and they realize that they've just been identifying with society they've been been identifying with someone else's behavior and they can check in come into the present moment and feel into what who they really are on a deeper level and also bring more awareness into everyday choices. So they're less caught up in subconscious patterns of behavior and they're able to move on then into behavior that's driven by more conscious awareness. So that was a bit long-winded, but the first stage is understanding that everything is okay, everything has happened for a reason, and reframing the past and sometimes that is also involving reframing trauma, which can be difficult, and finding the gold in that. For example, realizing that something that may have happened when you were a kid that was painful has really driven you to be this relentlessly driven man and a man that wants the truth. Without that, you wouldn't have had that. So number one, uh, just recognizing that everything's okay, accepting the past, giving gratitude to the past, Sometimes that could involve therapy. Sometimes it might involve hard conversations with mum and dad. Um, maybe you have to say something to mum and dad, but you have to get clear. And once you're clear with gratitude, then you can move on and you can explore. Um, and in my case, I, I explored ways of, of bringing more awareness into my life. Yoga was a big one. Meditation was a big one. Um, but I've also done a lot of other things. I've experimented with fasting. I've used psychedelics. Um, I've visited spiritual teachers. I've studied NLP. I've done a lot of uh, a lot of different things, um, just to really feel myself on on a deeper level and feel into my body because that's where our emotions live. So I'm just kind of reconnect with with who I am um, on. A physical, mental, and emotional level, but also on a, on a deeper level than that. You know, who am I that is more than this body and this mind? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. And um, I don't know if you had any you had any th things on that, Paul, or any processes you've been through that that kind of relates to what Craig said. Or um, I know Craig's you've kind of took a like you say a bit of a transformation, on you've kind of got to a stage where you're kind of a different guy how you operate and how you use your awareness and stuff. Um, I imagine you, Paul, have as well. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, I, for me, it's um, a lot of changed behaviours for myself. And, you know, as, as Craig said there, you know, I've been conditioned to think, of if, you know, to think of the way that I have. Um, me and Craig have spoke about it before in terms of, you know, being involved in a, a very masculine environment all my life. Do you know what I mean? I mean, my, my mother and my father, they separated when I was young. My mum brought me up, but I was constantly in an environment that was, you know, bravado and it, it, it was it was always about the fight. Do you know what I mean? The lads who I hung around with, the rugby environment from a young age, whether I was going in a pub and having a drink with mates, everything was all about the fight. Do you know what I mean? And I don't. I'm not talking physically. It, it, you know, although sometimes that happened. Yeah. But um, it, it, you know, emotionally, and you know, just making sure that you didn't show any weakness to friends. And and as I say, living for me like that, and I can only speak about myself. I'm not saying everybody's like this, but for me, 
that for me was a it was draining it was draining it eventually was just pulling and pulling and pulling and i suffered with really bad depression and 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 things like that and again you know people would look at me from an outside and say well he lives in a four bedroom detached house he's got a couple of cars on the drive his wife his kids he looks happy but i wasn't you know and and that's that's the message i want to get across to people is that you know all these external things do not make you happy inside. Eventually, it will come crashing down. But again, I'm only speaking for myself here. I'm not saying everybody's like this. I know plenty. I know a couple of millionaires that are very, very happy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this is not you know this is not. Um, I'm not trying to preach to anybody here. I'm just speaking about myself, and I'm hoping that some people might listen to it and identify with it. Um, and you know, I'm always willing to help people. But, um, you know, changing my behaviours, it's tough at times, you know, because I just revert back to type. You know, anger's a big one for me. I can get angry at the drop of a hat, but I, I can more now identify with it and pull myself in. Fear's a big one. I do some things off, off on the back of fear. Um, you know, and that's not... Uh, generally, fear doesn't make me run away. It makes me want to fight. Do you know what I mean? It's that fight or flight. I tend to want to jump, uh, f you know, feet first straight into that. Then behaviours for me needed to change because what I was doing was acting on those emotions was making my life more chaotic. And because it was more chaotic, then it was it was just spiralling and spiralling and spiralling out of control. Um, so changing my behaviours, the way that I think... Um, but let, you know, and it's not an overnight thing. This it's it's something that's going to be with. I'm going to be working on this stuff for the rest of my life yeah. because I'm a 35 year old guy and I've got 35 years of some shit thinking in my head <laughs> that yeah. needs ironing out. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. and and it is. It's a life. That, but what I love about you know and you know prayer and meditation's been spoke about, which I do on a daily basis. Um, it, this way of life for me, what I will say is easier and it's enjoyable because it's a different day. Everything's different. You know yeah, what I mean? Every yeah. single day is different. Um, and, you know, I'm I'm just much happier. I'm just much happier than this. I mean, it's, it's fascinating really because I come to an end of, with, with my rugby career and I took a dramatic pay cut to change careers, which I'm fortunate enough now to be in a, you know, strength and conditioning coach. Um, but I, I just, I can't get my head around sometimes the, the financial, you know, reduction that I took. And, but I was happier and I was thinking, what, well, like, yeah. how's that work? Yeah. Well, I'm happy inside. I'm doing all the right things. I'm not, you know, acting on those emotions that I was before. I'm a different person. I'm chasing a different challenge now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I guess I, th there's a couple of things there I keep, I keep wanting to ask you and ask you, but um, there's a quote that I saw the other day. I'm reading a book by Sam Harris. Um, let me look for it here. And it is talking about, like, meditation and stuff like that. Um there's a difference between being hostage to one's thoughts and being freely, non-judgmentally aware of life in the present. I don't know what that means to you guys, but um, I guess a lot of what, what you were saying before, Paul, was it's like reactive. It's very reactive. I, I, you know, I, I lived a lot like that before and I'm kind of changing the way the way I think and why I'm living. Um, but a lot of it's reactive just to, it could be a passing thought that, that pops itself up in consciousness or whatever. And you and you react to that, it might be angry, it might be something that has, happened last week and you, you let that affect what you're doing right now. Um, but I guess with meditation, um, which I do a lot now nowadays and, and, and I'm regularly practicing it, um, you get better and noticing it in everyday life, not just in that practice, but in everyday life when you when you're walking around, whatever you're doing, whether it's a negative thought, whether it's a just a random thought, and you, you realise you're lost in thought for a minute, you think, oh, what am I thinking of? What am I thinking of last week? Or what am I going to have for tea in on in next Tuesday? Do you know? Um, and I think that's a, that's a great quote to for a reason for why people may want to practice meditation i mean there's no real need for it um if you know if, if you're not being affected by anything that's going on in your life but um i, I guess i'd love to hear your spin on on what you do for meditation why why you practice it when you do it and and all that open that up yeah um 
I guess the first question is show me that someone that's not struggling with things in their life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, meditation, it's um, our natural state. But unfortunately, we've been conditioned to disidentify from that natural state. And again, there's no judgment there. I, I, I believe it's life's plan. You know, it's life's plan to, you know, take us on a, a journey, if you like, of disidentification so we can eventually come back into a re-identification with, with this natural state of, of, of who we really are. Um, so meditation is actually, it's a natural state. So by meditating, and it doesn't have to mean sitting like the Buddha, you know, it can be, you know, looking out through the window, um, walking around, doing something, uh, active meditation. It might be silent sitting, it might be eyes closed, eyes open. Really, it's just a return to this natural state um, where there's just a natural shift of identification from the thought factory into this space that can watch the thought factory without reacting or judging to that. Of course, in the beginning, it can feel difficult because we're identified with the thought factory you know, we think we're this type of person. We think we behave in a certain way and that can't change. And yeah, so in the beginning, it can prove difficult. But over time, as we develop this capacity to watch the stream of thoughts, um, then more and more we, we don't react so much to it. Like you said, Stevie, we, we, we're kind of, we're less reactive. And in my experience, it's not like the thought factory stops because it will never stop. We have an ego for a reason. It's not like we're trying to get rid of the ego. We're trying to help it to be more mature. Um, but what happens is over time, things that used to stick to us, for example, we might hold a grudge for weeks and weeks and weeks, and some people hold grudges for lifetimes. Um, the things that used to stick for us to us, they come in and they go. They might stick for a short period of time, but then they go again because ultimately we develop some kind of deep knowing that we're not only this body and this mind and this stream of thoughts, you know, we're, we're a lot more than that. There's something driving this life that is a mystery. And um, so we're just kind of coming more into touch with that, with that mystery. Now, just to finish on what I'm saying, and again, I want to try and re reply a lot of what I'm saying to, to men in general and, and also our rugby players. Um, there is a misconception that meditation is like this kind of really difficult practice of sitting silently with crossed legs, with the back straight, with eyes closed, singing oms, and, um, you know, really making an effort to get rid of thoughts. Well, it's actually not. We can't get rid of thoughts. Meditation is just a practice where we're able to accept and witness the thoughts in our head and if something like meditation is going to find its way into rugby, and I believe it will, if the right people with the right skill set can educate players and help them feel safe um, and see its benefits, then it's important that we're relaxed about it, you know, and, and, and we, we use different methods. It, it, it's, it's, it's more of an awareness. You don't have to sit for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, I find with that, like you say, a lot of people think when they meditate, they sit down, they go, I can't stop thinking, I can't stop. Well, you're not, you've built, you've built up how many years of thinking constantly in your head. You're not just going to sit down and just be enlightened straight away. Um, that's a lot, that's like a, a lot of misconception what people have. But I think the the main, um, I've heard it banded around quite a bit and stuff that I've seen on YouTube and stuff. But um, one of the things that you could try and relate to for men is, um, if you can do 10 or you can do 15 minutes sat down, just being still, just, you know, just watching yourself really, what, whether it's an impulse to get, get grab your phone or whether it's a thought that, that, that you don't like or you quite like, just watch that. Um, I reckon the magic happens the last, last five minutes of that. Um, and you relate to going to the gym, you know, if you're doing a hypertrophy trophy set, you'll do it for 12 reps. Those last two reps is where the magic happens and where you feel calmer and, 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 um, more adept to doing it and, and you, you get into it more, more relaxed into it rather than having a, a conscious effort to, to be sat there and still and stuff. Um, 
so yeah I think uh, I think what you say is right it's quite quite a you just have to relax into it and, and almost take a a sit back into it and 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 be more calm with it um, I'd be interested Paul for, for what you do for, for meditation and stuff <clears throat> yeah for me again you know just just going back to what I said before you know I can only speak for myself here because what I do find is is that you know the, the way that I choose to you know deal with my thoughts now and, and, and my actions um, I, I suppose you could say like a spiritual way of life there's some people who naturally just live that type of life. My right. my missus is one of them. She will not hold a grudge. She will get rid of it straight away. Do you know what I mean? And she'll she'll do this instinctively. And I can see why, because of the way that her parents brought her up. But for me, it doesn't come naturally. So what I mean for me, I mean in terms of meditation, I I, I use a lot of meditation when I'm looking for answers because generally if my mind's chaotic, I don't make the right decisions. Um so I sit, I just sit with with the thoughts. And like said, at first when I first started meditating, I was thinking it was about clearing everything out of my head and just sitting there in silence. And it's not. It's about sitting with your thoughts, what's coming into your head, you know, and um I mean again it's not and it's not sit it's not sitting down like a buddha do you know what i mean i, I go into total fitness uh, near me and i sit in a sauna for 15 minutes and i just sit there with my hands together and i just close my eyes and i just switch off and people can be talking about me but uh, like you say if you sit in there i generally try and do 15 minutes and um when i'm sat there for the first five minutes, I can hear people talking, but then eventually it starts going and going and going, and, I, and I'm into it. Do you know what I mean? So um, it's, I prefer it when I'm on my own, but you don't always get that luxury. Sometimes I just sit at home, you know, and I just meditate at home. But generally, I do it when I'm looking for answers. Um, and yeah, it, it works for me. It works. It calms me down. It controls my breathing. From a rugby point of view, in terms of, of rugby, I wish I knew this stuff when I was playing because I feel in terms of, you know, the um, psychological side of, you know, you know how draining and taxing rugby can be and the pressures you get put on um, from your coaches, from the owners of the clubs you've got to perform every week. Well, if some of the guys who don't have good coping strategies towards that pressure can turn to meditation and turn away from the side that oh, it's, it's a bit pansy-ish, it's not rugby related. Well, it is. It's all about recovery. It's about making sure that, you know, instead of being up here 24-7 and stressing about, I've got to play well, I've got to play well, I've got to play well, then just bringing yourself down and saying, Do you know what, forget about that game. Let's get my head clear. Let's get myself ready for a good performance. I feel, you know, in rugby, it can really take off meditation. I think there's a there's a place for it, but it's approaching the right people. It's not for everybody. Like any recovery strategy, some work for some, some don't work for another. You know, there's a perceived perception of how you, that recovery strategy works for you. I feel meditation will be the same, um, but I can certainly, off the top of my head, think of rugby players now who don't have the coping strategies to deal with the pressures that coaches put on them and they beat themselves up and they beat themselves up and they beat themselves up and they're fit as anything in training and they come to a game and they're absolutely flat and you go, do you know what? He trains like Taz and plays like Jane and I feel there's, there's a bit of that. It's too much pressure. They can't cope with it. They don't know how to cope with it. Um, so that that's my opinion on it. And let's not forget about the coaches themselves as well, who um, are under a yeah. lot of uh, pressure to perform and often get less actual recovery time than the players from a mental perspective. And so um, the whole field of, of coaches and um, providing support for coaches is also an interesting field as well, especially in the terms of understanding how to cope with stress and fatigue and um, how to optimise performance by not being in this kind of fight or flight phase um, the whole day long. It's really, really important. There's a lot of coaches struggling as, as well as the players. Yeah, that's, that's it's a very good point that actually, and I relate it to my my experiences and I used to play the game in the playing a Friday night, eight PM. I'd play it Friday morning, and I play it Thursday night as well. Thinking about the game, you know, I need to be here. I need to do this well. I need to do that. But you guess you realise, especially when you you, you kind of do a meditative practice and and you kind of build that up over time. Um, 
that you're not you're not playing the game the night before you're not you're not playing it in, in that day and you can only do what you do when it when it kicks off and then you're on then as long as you make sure you're on then you know that's that's a very it's a very big thing that I'd say to any young lad coming up um and it and it and it's it's helped me massively you know I'm, I I won't I don't put it into a routine you know there's a lot of people going around with meditation saying oh do it 10 minutes every morning and then I do you know 30 minutes on a night and I think that's just another thing that you 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 hanging your hat on or you you putting strain on yourself to do. I think you just do it when when you feel it's right and enjoy it. You know you don't have to put a kind of it's not like a it's not like something that you have to um, have a purpose to do. You know you do get residual effects of getting better, um, being more aware in, in in normal life and also in the practice. But I find that with yoga, I've done a yoga quite a few times, and it's good for me to go in there. As opposed to when I go to training, I'm going to training to be the best I can be and to lift as much weight as I can be. And it's quite humbling when I go into yoga. I know that I am not going to be the best at yoga when I go in. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I know that I'm going to be sweating. I'm, I'm going to be sweating like mad and I'm going to be struggling surrender. to get... <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Surrender to it. And um, and I enjoy it. You know, I, I enjoy enjoy the practice and um, it's quite nice to, to go in something without having to to have any real purpose of of mastering it you know it's quite it's quite nice and you know you guys will be in the same position every, you know when you're growing up everything's to try and get to the next stage and to achieve and achieve and achieve um and that's what i found kind of with, with meditation and yoga right guys you are now at my favorite part of the show the interval where we tell you all about the sponsors of the podcast which make this whole thing possible so i want to give a shout out to uk red security they have solutions designed for commercial and domestic fire safety and security. So whether that's what you wanting the latest technological, technological improvements in the world for your CCTV. So I've just got a house, actually. I'm doing a lot of work. It's taking about three months past the purchase date. Didn't want it to be. But I will be giving UK Red security a shout straight away for all my security needs and especially cctv um probably time to not be using those dummy cameras anymore um but yes yes um give them a shout uk red security probably the first point of call to go to for any, any service you need um business wise or domestic wise thank you for supporting it and the next one i want to to give a shout out to is msc nutrition now i want to give um nikki just to mention, Nikki Edmonds, who's the director uh, and owner of MSC Nutrition. So they are probably the, the go-to brand for supplements, sports supplements. They're used by a, a massive range of teams and athletes across sport and probably the go-to brand, I'd say, for elite sport. Um, they use a whole different range of products to, to make sure we're on top of our game. They support Leeds Rhinos, they support Mentality, they support England, they support Scotland, rugby. Um, and they also carry the same message to, to try and change the culture to, for athletes to, to be more open with each other. Also men as well, men listening. Um, so I think that's a really big tick in the box for MSC for me. And that is why I'm so over the moon to be working with both UK Red Security and MSC Nutrition. Um, without further ado, I guess I'll put you straight back in to the podcast. Peace. Um, and that's what I found kind of with, with meditation and yoga. That's that's what's interesting about this job where I'm in now because, like, obviously playing rugby and then going to a strength and credit, although... I've done a lot of the, the training principles and everything else, you know, as, as working with other strength and conditioning coaches. But I, if I was living the way that I was when I was playing uh, within this job, I would be under an extreme amount of pressure now because I want to be the best. I can, well, I want to be the best. I want to be the best. Whether I will be or not, I don't know. Um, but now it's like, we'll just be the best Paul Wood can be. Do you know what I mean? You're the best you can be at this precise moment in time. That's all that matters. It will come to you if you just try to stop trying to fight and, you know, just want everything when you want it. It'll just come to you. And I believe that's how mine and Craig's path crossed because how it happened was just 
So it was bizarre, really. Um, I, 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 Tell us. Tell us. Well, <laughs> basically, I was uh, meeting a friend, and, and me and my friend, we talk about meditation and, um, you know, this spiritual way of living, I'll, I'll say. And we met in Starbucks. Uh, I bumped into... Craig's girlfriend, who I'd not seen for years, she we had a brief chat, and she said, "Oh, I'm 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 with Craig now," and I said, "All oh, right," and she said, "He might be interested in speaking to you," and we got speaking, and then it, you know, we we've just become friends since, and now Craig's helping me with my strength and conditioning, and you know, giving me the advice. I can't ask for a better mentor. Do you know what I mean? So, it, it's just bizarre how it's happened, but I believe that me not. You know, me just living life in the moment, these things generally happen because don't get me wrong, I can resist a lot of things. When I don't get my own way, I'm like a five-year-old kid and I'll throw my toys out the pram and I want my own way and I'll try and manipulate and do little things to try and get it my way and it never works. That's going back to chaotic living. So what I do is I just try and surrender to it. You know, it's a great word, surrender. And the other great word, what I love now, is acceptance. Just accepting things as they are. The story you told about the horses and the guy who broke his leg. You know, I'd heard that story before, and it's a classic example. Just accept what's happening, because you know what? We don't know what's going to happen. Just don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it, it, it is a... Again, you know, Craig said about coaches and stuff like that, and you do see a lot of pressure on coaches, but when you lose one game, you know... It, you can't lose your head because you never know. You might win your next seven. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you just yeah. don't. You just don't know, do you? Um, but yeah, and, and just just one thing before you before I move on. It's, it's what you said there about playing the game. I used to play the game every single day in my head, and that's where Eckhart Tolle, the power and I comes in it because we're not yeah. there yet. We're not there. There's, <laughs> no. there's, a, there's a certain uh, technique to visualization that I really believe in. I feel visualizations are great tool to have to help performance but i think it's overused it's overused it's it's too pressurized uh, with players so i feel that you know just taking that step back and saying you know what let's worry about a lot of this stuff when it's actually happening and my my very first coach used to say carpe diem says seize the moment and it was basically he was saying stay in the moment and don't like push on that particular tackle. Don't wait for the next three tackles to happen before you start pushing, because you might just miss it. And it, it, everything goes back to the to the moment. Everything yeah. in life, it can relate to rugby, it can relate to social life, everything. So it's not rambling, now. Sorry. No, no, that's class. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, I think that's a, that's something I need to find more out about. I don't know if you if you guys know more, but the difference of visualization and like Paul says, just thinking and thinking and thinking. You know, is it, is it is it like a meditation? Would it be better to, to sit down and say, right, I'm going to think about what I'm going to do tomorrow just for 20 minutes and consciously do it and then and then be on your way or, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, well visualisation, how it's used in sport, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it because really what you're attempting to do is to create a situation in the future and a story in the head which will potentially manifest. So th there's nothing wrong with that from a performance point of view, but it's not meditation. It's different to meditation um, because it's not, a, it's not a practice of presence. It's a practice of projection, uh, whereas meditation is a practice of, of presence. So they can both be, be used effectively. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely not a practice of meditation, and those are that's the the basic difference between visualization and meditation. Yeah, I, I reckon it's probably it's probably just that difference in there where it's kind of thinking and worrying, just like subconsciously just happening to you, or just an, just an actual an episode where you take before the day and just say, all right, this is what I want to happen. I'm going to try and project it, and then leave it, and then just leave it detached there, do you know, rather than kind of worrying and thinking about it constantly and um well, visualizations are actually more beneficial from a place of presence so it's useful to meditate actually before the visualization okay interesting interesting um one question craig i kept trying to ask you before i kept forget forgetting about it um going into that yoga retreat where you initially went to in thailand what were your what were your mindset like before that? And then after the after you'd done the retreat, what was your self talk like? What was the debate like with yourself? Good question because we've not spoke about self talk yet. It's a really good question. Um, well, before I went 
to this yoga retreat in Thailand. I think it was about nine years ago. Um, I was happy as a pig in shit in my job. I was working in Wales, high profile job, managed a lot of staff, big salary, um, reputation, lines to her, all that. And then reluctantly, my wife at the time took me to Thailand on a yoga retreat. And of course, I hadn't done yoga before. I was into weights then and conditioning and I did a lot of training myself. And uh, I didn't really want to go, but I thought, go on, I'll, I'll give it a try. And it was actually a month long yoga retreat. So I went along and I didn't resonate so much with the physical side of it, probably because I was embarrassed. I wasn't that flexible at the time. And I didn't really buy into that so much. I did a, some of the classes, but the thing that blew my mind with the retreat was that every evening we'd have a two hour, sometimes three hour lecture about the science and the philosophy of yoga. And within that, there was discussions around the nature of life and who we are and looking after the body, what the mind is, the health and how yoga can improve health and so on and so on. There's a lot of different uh, lectures and it just blew my mind wide open actually. And there was no suffering at the time because I was actually in Thailand and it's beautiful and we're getting all these new learnings and teachings. And I hadn't really thought about going back. But then when I did go back with this enthusiasm, I realized that in that month in Thailand, like my values, and when I say values, what I mean is what became really important for, you, for me in my life and what I believed in my life had changed when I got back to Wales. It, it was like I was a different person looking through a different lens into the world. So the world looked very, very different. That's what happens when people have a so-called midlife crisis. There's a, I couldn't identify with who I was anymore because if I'm looking through a different lens, it's like, well, who am I? I wasn't this person before, what's, what's going on? And of course, because we've identified so, for so long with that other thought factory, we come to a place of, of worry and fear. It's like, well, I, I can't identify with anything at the moment. Shit, what's going on? Am I going crazy? And um, it actually took me two years to walk out of that job. Um, there wasn't anything wrong with the job. There's nothing wrong with rugby. I owe a lot of my life to rugby. There was nothing wrong with the people around me, although I projected that there was at the time. But there wasn't. The only shift was inside of me. I just shifted a lot inside. And the vo again, the voice, the voice that came up at the time, it was actually a voice of projecting my pain onto the world. I didn't have the awareness to own that pain for myself. So I was projecting it onto the world, which we, we do. Um, with a lack of awareness, I was projecting that rugby was um, corrupt. I was projecting that the people around me were uh, egomaniacs. I was projecting a lot of suffering onto the job I was doing. And what's all this about? Getting strong, getting fit, getting fast, winning. It's, you know, it's bullshit. Um, I mean, it's not bullshit. But I was, again, I was just projecting that because I didn't want to own the suffering inside. So it was easier for me to project it onto the world. And that's the phenomenon of projection. Which sometimes we don't own our, our own shit and we project blame onto the world. It's always somebody else's fault. So it took me a while to realize that actually it was all coming from my inside. But one thing I did realize is I, I did actually need to leave that job because when there's a mismatch in values, when the values of of what I was doing at that time don't match my, my deep values on the inside, then it's time to move on into something that is more aligned with my values. So eventually moving, doing more yoga trainings and more educations around um, becoming a life coach and things like that got me to a place where I could move into some kind of service, which is the men's coaching that I'm now doing, that is more aligned with my life values. That's that's brilliant, and um, it's 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 quite it's quite a like you said. I, I imagine it was quite a hard thing to deal with because such a shift over such a short time. You know, going to that retreat and then coming back with things changed. I imagine that was really hard thing to deal with. Um, the hardest thing was leaving um, a, a big salary. 
Yeah. <laughs> because there's nothing, of because there's nothing wrong with money. You know, money's yeah. not. We all need money to survive. So that that yeah, that was the the hardest thing. Yeah. Did you in in which way did you what what was what did the day look like when you actually said to yourself, right, I'm I've got to leave this. I've got to leave this gig and and do something else. Is is there any anything what you can remember in that day where you can describe it? Um, that's another good question. Um, let me think. It was difficult. It's really, really difficult because I remember telling my my boss at the time, Warren, that I wanted to leave, and um, it was difficult because you believe that no one will understand you, and maybe they didn't. But in the end, you just got to be true to yourself. It's it's. I mean, it's the same as as any. It's the same as any other point in your life when you're cutting ties with something. It's hard, you know, when you have to end a relationship, when you have to. Um, finish a job and move into another one. It's it's easy. It's so, sorry. It's difficult, and it, it just it was just a matter of time. But after about two years of of really struggling, being in that environment and being with myself, the time came, and it, I knew it was the right time. It just came. It was an act of grace, if you like it. It was that day on that time, and it was going to happen. And it reminded me actually of a time um, when I was. About 19, I was a hod ca an odd carrier for a year and a half. And um, yeah, uh, the same pattern actually happened where for the last three months of that job, I'd go home and I was crying when my mum said, get up for work. And in the end, I just said, fuck this, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. And then I went back to university. So it's hard, but cutting the ties and making that big decision is always the doorway to transformation. It always is. And some of the work I do with men and some of the skills I've learned through being involved with an organization called the Mankind Project, is that fear is, is the doorway to transformation. It really, really is. But going through that doorway is not always easy, but it's always reaped with benefits. Yeah. Well, um, so obviously you, you, went, you went to Thailand um, with your wife. Um, what, was the, what was the crossover like with, with your wife? Was the, what were the conversations like? I'm going to have to leave my job and, you know, were there much understanding and was it all very, very much, like I say, chaotic because it was such a an instant thing? Um, it was quite chaotic, but she was very supportive. In fact, she's the only one that I, I spoke to because, of course, we've not discussed this yet, but men don't open up. We've been conditioned not to open up and it's not easy. So she was the only one I opened up to, so it was difficult for her. Um, it's funny, actually. She We're not together now, but we're still really, really good friends. Um, but she always said when we ended our relationship that she wishes she'd never introduced me to yoga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, going on to onto your retreats as well. Um, what are the types of stuff then? Obviously, I've seen a lot about men's circles and and the idea that men actually need to come together like like all times and, and talk and open up and very much like what we're what we're speaking about now, but. Um, what is it that, that goes on on the retreats and what do you find most powerful? Well, the, f um, the thing with the men's retreats that I offer, and I also offer coaching as well, but with the men's retreats, it's true that men and women, you know, especially when they lived in communities, did sit in circles. There's something about the circle. The circle is a symbol of wholeness. It's a symbol, a symbol of completeness, unity. It's a sim symbol of uh, infinity and, uh, and strength. And th th there's something about it. In fact, um, I would recommend to all rugby coaches to have more circle meetings with the players. Um, try it and, and you'll know what I'm talking about. There's something about not having barriers in the way and sitting in a circle and looking each other in the eye. It's really powerful. But in relation to the retreats, really the, 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 the initial aim of, if, of the retreat is to create safety, to create some kind of safe container where guys can sit in the circle and share or listen. And simply by just sitting in a circle of men, it, it brings, um, for me, it brings a sacredness to what it means to be a man. It really, really does. I feel a real power when I'm sat in a circle amongst blokes, especially blokes that want to go under the surface and dig deeper. Um, and there's a lot of benefits. One of them is when you hear other guys sharing, you realize you're not on your own even though you went there thinking you were the only one suffering. Um, you learn to listen properly. You learn to listen with compassion, which has benefits in your life. Um, 
you feel empowered by listening to other men, you feel confident, you can share things in the circle that you've been holding on to for a long, long time, and somehow that creates space inside. It's also a space where you can share your potential greatness as well, where we can practice sharing our qualities and our gifts, which is also useful because we've been suppressed not to do that. We've been suppressed not to show off, not to express ourselves, and it leaves us half done. So it's a place where we can share, if you like, our darkness, our shadow, because it needs to come up, and it's a safe space to do that, and it's also a space where we can share, you know, really our potential gold. So within my retreats, the circle is is the focal point, but in terms of what we go through, um, we have certain themed circles around various parts of, of life, um, you know, career, relationships, father, mother, et cetera, et cetera. But also a thread that's running through the, the retreats is um, um, some shadow work, um, which is, again, owning the parts of ourselves that we don't like others to see and bringing them out into the open. Now, we use a, a relatively simple map to do that. We use a map of the archetypes. And what, I, what that means is the energy is running through us. Every single man, we have potential energies running through us. Uh, one is a warrior energy. We can all relate to that as rugby players. Another one is an energy of a lover, which sometimes we don't relate to too, too much as a rugby player or, or a man in general, sorry. The other one is a magician energy, which is this energy of introspection and looking inside and creating things and... The last one is the energy of the king, which is um, the energy of leadership and responsibility and creating a legacy and empowering others and really stepping into a world driven by passion and a world driven by conscious choice. So that provides a really interesting map for guys to feel into and they can, from that, feel into where the blocks are and what are they resisting and what are they open, what are they kind of biasing towards um, so then they, they can kind of decide in life, well, maybe I need to kind of work more on the lover or the magician or the king or maybe I need to refine my warrior energy. It's a really useful map for men to navigate through the world. So we use a lot of different practices to embody that, music, yoga, different types of meditation, journaling, um, helping guys to do um, goal-setting work, work around finding passion and finding mission, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of map I use to help guys navigate in the world better. But also we have a lot of other introspective exercises in the retreat which help us to come more to a place of presence. So the retreat, generally speaking, is a combination of coming inside, into the present moment, learning how to witness life without reaction, learning how to bring more loving kindness inside. But it's also learning practices to navigate in the world better and to change our behavior into a more desirable harmonious behavior yeah that's 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 brilliant and um i, I know we touched upon it before um about the self-talk and stuff and i know you wanted to to chat about that i was just wondering what your point of view is on that because um it's something that i look back on which i'm quite bad at with when i was going through injuries and and stuff like that and and when you're not really knowledgeable or you, you know you don't know much stuff about this you, it is like i guess it's subconscious actions and and i try and think of it like as if you've you've drove a car to work and you can't remember you can't remember anything really when you look back can you about about when you've drove a car and what gears you're in or anything and i i guess a lot of it is if you try and relate that to what your self-talk is like in your head um and i kind of you go through a stage where you're trying to become more aware of that and and actually notice it going on, and it's quite a tough practice. But I'd, I'd love to hear both of your guys' thoughts on, on negative self-talk or how we can turn that around. Yeah, self-talk's an interesting one. And again, when we come to that point in life where we start to ask questions and it becomes a little bit uneasy, the self-talk kicks in even more. I actually wrote a, a blog recently called The Internal Risk Inspector. And uh, that's actually related to, related to the voice in the head that talks to us, you know, this critical part of us. Um, and again, Stevie, it's, it's important that when this happens that um, there's a way for men, a way for rugby players to understand where that voice is coming from. 
because ultimately the voice might be there to protect you. You know, maybe as a little baby, um, you were told not to express yourself, you were told not to cry, uh, you were told not to move around, you were told not to climb, you were told not to punch your brother, etc., etc., etc. So we chose then to behave in a way to please mum and dad. And also at that time, as a protection mechanism, you know, the, the internal risk inspector, this voice would often come in whenever there was a chance that it thought we could be hurt. So it would say things like, don't express yourself in this situation. Don't cry. Don't show your feelings. You're going to get hurt. Don't express yourself. And so, but it's the, but it's, it, it's actually there to protect us. It thinks it's protecting us. Now, it, the voice stays with you all your life, but there comes a point where it doesn't serve you at all. It actually limits you. It limits you from really living a life of passion and following your dreams, and it's very critical. So what I'm getting to here is the first part of the understanding is knowing where it came from, which was early childhood, knowing that it was actually there to protect you, knowing that it will never go away, but you don't have to listen to it. You can ask that knowledge that it's there and make your own decisions. Knowing that it's your little boy speaking and recognizing that you're not a little boy anymore, you're an adult. So that understanding helps us to not identify with that voice anymore. It's a part of us. It's coming from the shadow, but we don't have to identify it. Now, it's not easy because the classic ones especially, correct me if I'm wrong, Stevie, but when you're injured and you're out and you don't know how it's going to um, be when you return, the classic one is you're not good enough or, you know, you're worthless or you're not important, you don't matter. You know, these voices are, are ones that really come come up in, in early early childhood and they're called deep wounds. But once we develop some understanding of where they came from, we can come to a place of conscious awareness, conscious choice, and make our own choices and create, if you like, our own voice. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And um, I reckon we've probably covered a lot there. Um, and I think it would be good. I've just had a free coach and less than a few Craig and not with you, Paul. But, um, but yeah, that's brilliant. And I guess, I guess if you want to just let people know where they can find you, Craig, and, and what, you know, how to... And I'll get in touch and, and maybe you know look at some more of your stuff as well. Yeah, um, at the moment I have a coaching business called Craig White Coaching. And on my site you'll see information about my retreats and also some of my coaching services. Um, I still also have a company called White Health and Performance as well, which I've had for a while, which is more along the lines of um, auditing for team sports and also um, mentoring of strength and conditioning coaches, which is a mentoring um, program related to both professional but also personal development as well. Um, so thanks for that, Stevie. But I just want to also end by saying um, I'm also in the process of um, really looking a little bit more deeply into what's happening in rugby and I'll soon be producing um, some event or workshop um, or some strategy aimed at looking at how we can bring more awareness of our emotions, but also coping with stress via recovery methods. So bringing a lot of different meditation strategies, breathing strategies and um, coping mechanisms into uh, the recovery program. Because in a rugby player's program, especially at the top end, every single aspect of performance is covered like a jigsaw but there's one piece of the jigsaw missing which could prevent a lot of suicides and unrest. And that piece of the jigsaw is how to cope with emotional stress and emotional health in general. If players, especially at a young age, were taught about how to understand and manage their emotional landscape and how to self-regulate the nervous system so they could cope with stress, we would see a lot less suicides in rugby. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. We'll wrap it up there and um, give me a shout for that, Craig, when you want to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, Paul. Cheers, Steve.